TitleMatchNetwork.com. Were there ever plans for you to ever return to WWE? You know, there were plans at one time I had heard um, right after Mike's first suspension that they wanted to do something with me. The time he didn't come back Rangel, they wanted to do something pretty similar to what they did with Rock. And because uh, Vince had asked me, and I said, nah, man, I want to stay with the team with my partner. I can't do that to him. I wouldn't do it. Right. Um, at the, the last time I was with WWE is when I did the deal with Heidenreich. And, uh, you know, I did that. I got called in. You know, my brother says, hey, we got good news and bad news. Good news is, you get, you know, we're going to get you a contract. Bad news is, you got a guy that was almost like Hawk was on the road at Heidenreich. Hmm. I said, no, ain't nobody was ever that bad. And, well, I wasn't far off. Right. But, I mean, I, I never really, and the problem is, I really can't say anything about Heidenreich because I didn't know Heidenreich that well. I really didn't get to know him. Um, he was a great guy. At one time, I needed to borrow some money for something. He lent it to me. I paid him right back. Uh, he was good, he was a good guy in that sense. He had a big heart like Hawk did. You know, a lot of the quality was like Hawk. The only thing I got a little bit irritated with, he didn't respect the gimmick. The gimmick was 22 years built on being a top-notch stud, and he just didn't respect the gimmick. Whose idea was it to parody with Heinrich? Oh, Stephanie. Stephanie's. Yeah. And, you know, and I wanted to make it work. So I like Stephanie. I really like Stephanie, and I respect her. Hopefully someday. Uh, and I know she'll probably be the one that takes over the company someday, I think. Hopefully I can get a chance to work with her. Because I, I, I get along good with Stephanie, and I can work with Stephanie, and I get along good with, with Triple H and stuff like that. So I have no problem with those guys. What were your initial thoughts of the team? I mean, did, did Heidenreich listen to you at all? Yeah. I mean, he was great. He listened to everything else. I just think it was a, a bunch of different things, factors came into it. The fact of... Um, him not being ready for that kind of a shot and not really knowing the instincts on what to do in a match at that at particular times, like Hawk and I. Hawk and I knew everything together. I could tell after he's done a spot, he would look over to me if he would have knocked his head or something. I would quick tell him the next part of the spot. I always knew his spot. Right. And I knew the whole match. You know, that's why I get pissed off at some of these guys that are helping run the company right now that have never sold out a match. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Against the top guys in our business, Rick Flair's and Dusty Rhodes's and Nikita Kowalski's and Magnum TA's and Arn Anderson's and Tully Blanchard's, Bobby Eaton, Dennis Condry, Stan Hansen's. I've learned to shut up and listen to Larry Zabisco's to all these top guys. And I've learned to know every bit of my part, my partner's part, and their part of the match. So I know wrestling. I know how to heal. I know how to baby face. Just because I haven't thrown 15 arm raises doesn't mean I don't know, to do, don't know how to do them. Right. It's a big argument I had with my brother one time. Well, if you can't get heat in this business, how are you going to teach somebody to get it? I said, what are you talking about? My deal here with Matt Hardy? I said, are you kidding me? Give me some steam. Right. Don't give me 10 seconds. Give me some steam and I'll get heat. But at the, at the end, what hide right there, just nothing. I love Matt Hardy, did, but it just took the steam out of me. You know, it took the heart of the business out of me. I didn't have it to go on as a single after that. I would have just matter, I would just much rather go behind the scenes, be a top agent, and help build guys. Did it ever bother you to see like Heidenreich in the colors with the spikes and all that? Or I mean uh I think it bothered other people more than it bothered me. Right. You know, this is a work. This business is what it is. It just proved that you just can't throw anybody in that spot. Were you surprised that they gave you the tag belts? No, but then and Vince is like shocked. And out of all the other teams that were there, you know, Eminem was a great little tag team. It wasn't like working without Joey. Great. Joey was great. Johnny was great. They were good. You know, I taught them. A lot of people don't realize. I taught those guys. From we first worked with them to the end, they grew a lot in the ring. Definitely. Because they were able to work with other guys after that. Right. You know, and it proved that whoever they worked with the next little angle with afterwards, you know, the, the Mexicos or whatever – they were able to step right in there and be the top tag team. They weren't the top tag team when we got with them. They were still green as heck. I took them over an eight-month period. If that wasn't proof enough, I don't know what could have been to the office. Joey even came up and said, man, I, I got to thank you. you. You taught us so much in, in the ring on how to be heels, when to turn up that extra gear, when to get the heat, when to do this, when to do the big move, when to not to do the move, you know, when to go home. And that's what I taught them.
Getting back to Heidenreich, I remember uh, maybe about a year ago, he did a couple of interviews that talked about you lending him like $5,000 or something, or he lent you $5,000. And so apparently he claims that he had to go to your brother to get the money back. What was the whole story with that? It was a deal. I had some financial thing. I got in a bind and I had to pay something and he had it right. laying around. If I'd have had it, I'd have given right to him. And he lent, he lent it to me and wasn't three weeks later, I paid him back. Right. Four weeks later, I paid him back. Maybe a month. You know, it was no big deal. He didn't have to go to my brother. Heinrich says, just give it back to me when you can. I said, all right, bro. If you need it right away, let me know. And he never said anything. Until he went crying to my, to like a baby. To my, I said, bro, what'd you go crying to him for? Just come to me. And I said, give it to that your check. Right. Give it to you. It was like I didn't have it. Yeah, like I had plenty of it in my retirement fund. I just didn't want to wait a month. Excuse me, pay the 10% deal on it. And get it out, you know. So that was all, uh, you know, one of the immaturity things in a gimmick where he should have felt good enough as my partner to come to me and say, hey, man, let's just, you know, I need I need that myself. Did you guys part of the hatchet or is there still heat there or? Oh, there's no heat there. He tried doing something thing on YouTube one time. And uh what are your thoughts on that? Well, he tried to say it wasn't him. I mean, he apologizes for it now, says he's reborn again now and refound God again. And I and I hope for him and his family he has. Right. Because because he he was a very spiritual guy. That's one of the things I liked about him, you know. But uh, you know, you can't be halfway spiritual. You can't be be spiritual and then have your ears bleeding from doing too much things you shouldn't do because that's part of your sinuses. And then I've been, you know, having the state trooper say you can't sleep in this rest area here and send you to the hospital. Then me having to drive 150 miles to pick you back up the next day. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You, you got to make the decision to be, you know, and he didn't make that. And, you know, and, you know, where I got hot at him is that when he started talking about my kid, there's where I draw the line. I, I knew a lot of things about his wife. I've seen a lot of things. I heard a lot of things from other guys. I never said a word. I could have ripped on his wife, ripped on his kids. I didn't say anything. He said something about my my son, accusing him of doing certain things like that YouTube deal. I drew the line and said, hey, listen, you got a problem with me. You come to me. Right. You know what I mean? How did you contact Did you call him? or did No, you I YouTubed him right back on the things. Listen, right. here, you, you know, not so many nice words. Right. You know, but I let him know. I said, listen, you got a problem with me. You come to me. Leave my family out of this. All right. Big, tough man attacking people. So you attacking Hawk. He's dead. Huh. He'd have knocked you out right away. Without a doubt. Huh. Without even thinking twice. You know? So, I mean, you know, I, I you know, I, I told him, I said, listen, I, I, even, I ended it by saying, listen, I wish John Heidenreich all the best. You know, I ended it as the better man, you know, the upper man. I said, hey, I, um, I I hope he's doing great. I hope he's doing good for he and his family. I told him, I even texted him one time, said, listen, man, if you want to use the gimmick to make money as the other half of the Legion of Doom over in Europe, go ahead. I don't care. All right. If it helps you out where you can make money for your family, go ahead. But I found out he sold the pads to some guy in Germany or something. Yeah. Doesn't, it doesn't matter. Before you started teaming up with him again, they brought you in as an announcer, I believe. How did that go? Well, I thought it would have went well. They never gave it a shot. That's the problem. Right. See, and here's the funny thing with the announcer part. They get mad at me because I didn't know some of their guys. <laughs> well, hello. Do you think I sit home and I just watch wrestling? Right. I'm a coach, man. I was coaching the semi-pro football teams. Guys that have made it further than any guys are on our roster in the WWE. You know, and they, my brother got mad at me because I didn't know some of the guys. Well, so what? I sat there with Jim Ross. I said, what does this guy do? What's his favorite move? What's his thing? I said, I wrote that on a piece of paper. I did my homework. You know, I said, it's not like you sent me home and said, here, look over some of these tapes and find out what some of these guys do. They got mad at me. Seriously, I didn't sit around and watch Raw. <laughs> I said, you got to be kidding me, right? Because everything out there is ad living. It's feeding off JR or feeding off, you know, the right. king anyway. I mean, what the heck? Huh. I thought it would have been a good, I think I could be a great announcer with JBL right now. I think he and I would be a great team out there behind the mic. Now, getting back to the WWE run with uh, Heidenreich, was it hard being on the road once again full-time? Uh, yeah, I, I didn't like to be back on the road all the time the way it was, you know. And, um, especially when the match was, like, pulling teeth. Right. You know, you never knew which John Heidenreich was going to show sometimes, hmm. you know. Right. You go there with the best intentions of work and – 
Then he'd show up late, and then you got the agents who were there ripping me a new butthole like it's my fault. Who are some of the agents? Well, I mean, you know, you had Fit and Steamboat and, right. you know, and uh, Malenko. Right. You know, I think T2 Connie and Malenko yelling at me for some reason. One of the guys that never drew a dime in this business telling me what to do. A lot of people say that about Dean, that he didn't respect a lot of the vets. And No, he didn't respect a lot of the vets. But that's because I think he had a lot of the little man syndrome and got pissed off a lot because there's a little guy that didn't make the big money. Right. And this is his way to get back at everybody. Hmm. That's just the way Dean comes off, though. Dean comes off like a cocky, cocky, arrogant little bastard. That's just the way he comes off. A lot of people have said that on an interview, so. Were you well, respected? That's not the first one. <laughs> that won't be the last. Were you respected by a lot of the younger guys in the locker room? Yeah. never had. I never had a problem with respect in the locker room. Because I helped out a lot of guys before the matches. Right. I didn't have to, but a lot of the new guys coming again, you know, like the big guy from India, what's his name? Uh, Kali. Kali. I helped him the first day he came in there and throw chops and throw kicks. Try to teach him to be more vicious, you know? And uh, a lot of the other guys, Bobby Lashley, tried to teach him how to throw a flying tackle. You know, different guys like that. And try to, you know, guys are trying to throw power slams. I watched a guy throw the other day. What's that, uh, what's that skinny kid that threw a power slam the other day? Uh, Punk. Right. Do a power slam look horrible. Why? You mean to tell me you don't have enough moves in your repertoire that you got to do a power slam? Usually a power slam is done by one guy because it's only one or two guys can do it. It hasn't changed much in 20 years. Still, only one or two guys can do it. Guys got to be able to have good hips, loose hips, throw those hips and get up high and go get some, get some ups to him when he's doing it, you know, and then protect the guy as you're going around. The way some of these guys just do it and just hold on and swing the guy, and they come like this far from guy's head hitting the canvas, man. I've seen that too, yeah. That happened the other night. Yeah, I was watching it. How, how did the locker room change as far as like with all the young guys in the locker room compared to when you were there a couple of years ago? You know, the locker room's a locker room. The guys are going to respect the locker room because the day they do not respect the older guy in the locker room or the guy that paved the way for them is the day they need to get the butt kicked. Seriously. And a lot of times, they can count on the older guy being the guy to kick their ass. Hmm. Seriously. I mean, right. no, right. a lot of these guys have got into wrestling because they watch guys on TV and say, oh, geez, I can do that. And never did anything badass in their life. Our generation of wrestlers had, came from school hard knocks, a lot of guys. A lot of guys like Steve Williams that didn't get to make it in pro football or somewhere else. It was a four-time All-American somewhere else. Or Mike Rotunda that was an All-American or... You know, right. there's a lot of tough guys. The Steiners are two tough guys in our business. The other guys will kid around with and stuff, you know. And, you know, on top of your Ken Shamrocks and your, you know, Steve Blackman's and other guys like that, too. You know what I mean? They're some tough guys. 